All right, so welcome everybody. We're glad you could be here with us. Uh, my name's Jarrett. I'm the DuPage Ross coordinator. Glad you could be here. Thanks to everybody who made it out to the Ross Council meeting last week. I got to say that was one of the best meetings we had. Got a lot of really good feedback from people, and we we're really glad that everybody could make it and kind of see what the recovery community is like in some other areas around us. And I think there's a lot of really inspiring work being done. So it was very cool uh, that so many people were able to see that. If you weren't able to make that one, like every meeting we have, we actually record them and put them up on our YouTube page. So if you jump on YouTube, you can just search DuPage Rosk. You should be able to find our channel. We put all of our council meetings, and then we also put up our presentations on there too. So you can check those out if you miss something or want to go back and look at something that we've done. Uh, I do have some announcements before we kind of get into the presentation part of today. Um, I have been mentioning this. So our spring drive is actually for diapers. So uh, we're collecting diapers and other baby supplies, uh, baby wipes, things like that for donation to the Teen Parent Connection. Really great organization. We understand the challenges that a lot of young parents are facing, especially those who might be struggling with, um, you know, recovery or mental health related issues. So let's do our part. We want to donate some diapers and baby supplies. Um, after talking to them, they said that sizes four, five, and six are kind of the most needed. Now, I personally have not ever bought diapers before. So this is all new to me. So I'm learning this stuff as we go. Uh, but those are the sizes that are most popular. Um, if you're able to donate or you'd like to, you can take them up here to Serenity House where we're at in Addison. Um, we're usually here Monday through Friday, normal hours. Um, if you're not able to do that and want to make different arrangements, uh, you can contact us. I got my email on there and then uh, we can work that out. But so far, we've gotten some great donations. We're going to run this through to the end of the month. Um, so around June, we're hoping to make those donations over there. Uh, I just, again, and I said this at the last meeting, we're really proud of all the donations we've collected over the past year. Um, in addition to diapers, we've done uh, socks, we've done winter coats. Um, we're going to try and do a drive every few months. And I'm just very proud of all the uh, donations and care that people have put into these drives. And I think we're actually hopefully making a difference for people who are kind of struggling and need this type of stuff. Uh, next thing I want to talk about is the virtual Narcan training. So we do this through the DuPage RCO, which I think you guys have heard me talk about a couple of times, DuPage Recovery Community Organization. Uh, every month, the third Thursday of the month, we do a, a virtual Narcan training. Um, you can see the Zoom info is up there. That information is probably going to change after this one. I think this is the last one under that current meeting info. Uh, but tomorrow, 3.30. And I believe Danny, uh, my partner Danny, who will be co covering that training tomorrow. Um, it's a good brush up for people who maybe have already taken a training, but it's also really good for newcomers. So if you have a friend or a family member or anything like that that kind of wants to learn about harm reduction, learn about opioid reversal, I really suggest it. It's only about a half hour long. And then you can connect with us too about how to access harm reduction materials. If you or a family member or friend wants some Narcan or maybe access to fentanyl test strips or even maybe xylazine test strips, you can reach out to us after that meeting and we can see what we can do about connecting you. I just wanted to mention, we are looking for presenters always. This isn't just specific to right now. Um, for both our, both our DuPage Ross Council and our Ross presentation series. So the DuPage Ross Council meetings, which uh, are on the second Wednesday of every month, we really try to focus on um, local organizations or people who are kind of uh, working in the recovery sphere, um, kind of shine a spotlight at them, but also let people know what type of services um, they can have access to in DuPage. Uh, as far as the presentation series, this is when we kind of take you know, the hour to dig in a little bit deeper into a topic in recovery. Um, and then kind of that gives us time to maybe have some conversations about it. And we've done all kinds of things in that presentation series. We've done, you know, cannabis, we've done uh, domestic violence, we've done family in recovery. Uh, last month, Bruce Seawick did a really great presentation on psychedelics. Um, we're just looking for people to talk about stuff they're passionate about in the recovery community um, and just come have a conversation and, and fill us in on, on all those topics or what's going on in your organizations. So if you're interested, you can always reach out to me, got my email and my phone number up there, and uh, we hope to hear from you and get you on our schedule. Also coming up, there is a 5k run walk and a color run uh, DuPage County Fairgrounds. This is being put on through NAMI DuPage, uh, the Prevention Leadership Team, and Serenity House. Um, the money that's collected in this will be going towards the Teen Ambassador Program, which is a really amazing program using adolescents in DuPage. Uh, but you can see there's a few different events that day. 
5K run, walk at eight. Uh, we've got the diaper dash with the little ones at 9.30. And then NAMI and Serenity and PLT are doing this color run at 10. Uh, I don't know if you've ever done a color run before. Uh, I'm sure you've seen it online. They are very viral and popular on Instagram and things like that when they throw colored powder at you. Uh, but a bunch of Ross members and RC members will be there either volunteering or taking place in the actual run. So I'm going to keep that QR code up here for just a second. If anybody's interested, they can go ahead and click through to that and get registered. Or if you're interested in volunteering or anything like that, it should be a really fun event. I also, Couple. real quick, Jarrett, can I just say something about the color Please. run? Please. Um, there's also, you'll get a t-shirt for the color run. Um, it's white, so you know the color will stay. Um, and we're also doing a pancake breakfast um, donated by one of the Rotary Clubs as well. So it'll be a great event. Please share within your communities. Um, it'll be awesome. Thank you. Thanks, Rachel. I appreciate it. Uh, a couple more things, events that are coming up tomorrow. PLT is actually having a psychedelics and behavioral health presentation. Uh, Dr. Aaron Weiner uh, will be presenting on the current state of psychedelic science. Uh, and this is actually for some CMEs for physicians, uh, PAs, psychologists, et cetera. Uh, it's from 8.30 to 11. Um, that QR code there will take you to a registration form. Uh, Dr. Weiner always does amazing presentations. And this is uh, a topic that I'm very, very interested in, which is why we did this topic last month. Because uh, there's a lot of really cool uh, cutting edge work being done in psychedelics and how they're being used to treat people with mental health and substance use disorders. So this should be a cool one that's going on tomorrow at 8.30 to 11. We have also got uh, Dr. Anna Lemke is coming through the Glenbard Parent Series. Uh, I had a chance to see her present last year, and she does a phenomenal job. She has this book, Dopamine Nation, so kind of talking about living in this environment of uh, high dopamine stimulus, so everything from smartphones and gaming to drugs, you name it, uh, and, and especially how that affects kids. Uh, but she does great presentations. So this is going on tomorrow from 12 to 1.30. Again, we have a QR code up there. Feel free to scan it to register, uh, but you won't want to miss that one. It's, it's very, very good. And lastly, uh, if you were at our presentation last week, uh, the Lake County ROSC in NERCO, which is the Northern Illinois Recovery Community Organization, they're holding an event next week. I believe it's next week, right? Yeah, 25 to 26, uh, along with Faces and Voices of Recovery, who are a pretty amazing organization um, who we've done some work with before with the ROSC. Uh, having an in-person training over two days called Our Stories Have Power. Uh, I've taken this one. It's phenomenal, especially if you have lived experience. The whole point behind this is those of us who have lived experience uh, should be able uh, to share what we've been through and use our experiences to help people who are maybe newly in recovery or might still be struggling. Um, so if you're interested in your free and you want to go up to Waukegan for this training, go ahead and scan that QR code. I promise you it is phenomenal. And Dr. Mary and everybody at the NERCO and Lake County Ross do really, really good work. Um, so I'm, I'm highly recommend that one if you get a chance to do it. I'm going to stop sharing here after all the announcements. Okay, so this month we are talking about PTSD and trauma. Um, I'm glad to have Sam here with us to present on that. I want to just give a quick little uh, intro anecdote story, which is, um, you know, in October, I will be celebrating five years of continuous sobriety. Um, now, this time, what was different uh, from all the times I've tried before? Well, there's a few things that were different, but one of the major ones was really digging into what were some of the core reasons that I was out there using and, and living like that for so long. And I was very, very blessed to be given a, um, a counselor in treatment who started talking to me about trauma. Um, and this is something that hadn't come up before. And I always thought, and this was my narrow thinking, that something like trauma was, you know, um, reserved for maybe like veterans, right? Or somebody who'd been through these like life threatening experiences, uh, maybe just extreme domestic violence or sexual assault. So I didn't view anything I went through as traumatic. And then the more we talked about it, um, you know, and the more I told him my story, he said, you absolutely dealt with trauma. You know, I, I was uh, living on the street for a number of years. It's incredibly traumatic to have to get through uh, major health issues. You know, there was a number of things that I dealt with that could definitely be in that category of trauma. And once I was able to identify that and accept it and and work on it, you know, and, and understand what it was that I went through, uh, it really changed how I looked at my recovery. 
And I think the move towards uh, trauma-informed care is so essential for what we do. Um, last year, we actually had Bruce Seabrook present to us on some trauma-informed care stuff, and that's the way things are going. That's the way the wind's blowing, and it should be that way. Um, and so I'm glad to have Sam here, who works with us not only at Serenity House, but also with ROSC and RCO um, to talk to us about PTSD. And I want to say one more little thing before we start. start. The past two days, a bunch of us have been up at a junior high school in West Chicago. So we were up there doing some prevention education work. So we talked to hundreds of kids over the course of two days. Um, now, obviously a lot of that was related to substance use prevention education, because that's kind of our specialty. But I really wanted to note that when we kind of didn't even detour, but when we talked about mental health disorders, that was one of the things where the kids really kind of came to life because luckily we're at a point in time where we're talking about that stuff. So these kids who are aged, you know, 12, 13, 14 may not have a substance use issue, but when we talk to them about things like depression, anxiety, trauma, these are things that they do experience. And these are things that they do talk about. And so I just think it's a really, really important topic, very timely for what we've been working on. And uh, we're gonna leave some time at the end for any kind of discussion, any kind of personal experience. And uh, we're glad to have Sam here. So Sam, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you for presenting for us today. All right, thank you, Jared. See if I can get this going here. All right. How's that looking? Is that up okay? All right. It looks so weird on my screen. Um, all right. Uh, yeah, thank you. So really kind of, I'll, I'll do a quick introduction. Um, so yeah, my name is Sam. I'm a, I'm a counselor at the men's residential program. I also work with um, Rask and the DRCO. Uh, and, you know, when Jared asked me to do a presentation months and months ago, um, I really wanted to, to think about something that I wanted to learn more about um, so I could be a more competent counselor, but also just uh, and that's something I could also just share with anybody. So I'm, I just want to be clear. I'm not any, I'm not a trauma expert. Um, I uh, have a background in social work on the CDC, but I'm, you know, this isn't, this is really coming from a place of being curious and wanting to just learn more about PTSD, learn more about how it works and, and just really wanting to be able to help my clients and um, having this information available for anybody who wants to learn more about PTSD. Um, one of the things I noticed uh, when I started working at Serenity House is I had a, a client say to me once that every time she uses, it was a trauma. And when she said that, I really thought about the role that PTSD plays in the recovery. Um, and so with, with that, I really started kind of researching more, um, more and more about PTSD. And so... Um, and so what we change inward, inwardly will change our outer reality. I really felt that this was kind of speaks to how PTSD works. Like we don't, you don't see somebody and think, oh, they have trauma or you don't know what they're going through, right? So a lot of times it's this inside um, war that's going on. And so working to kind of bring that war to the outside is a way to really kind of um, to deal with it and, and move through it. Um, and so those diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder are three times more likely to abuse substances. Um, I'm going to try not to read as much of the slides as I can, but um, some of these will be definitions, so bear with me. Um, post-traumatic stress disorder is a psychiatric disorder that may occur in people who have experienced or witnessed a traumatic event, a series of events, or a set of circumstances. And so an individual may experience this as emotionally or physically harmful, life-threatening, and this may affect mental, physical, social, and spiritual well-being. And so a little bit about the exposure variations to PTSD. So currently the DSM-5, which is the Diagnostic uh, Statistical Manual, it really only recognizes PTSD as being a, um, a one-time traumatic event. Whereas complex PTSD is something that can be ongoing. <clears throat> it's an ongoing trauma. It can last for months. It cannot last for years. That's pretty typical, especially in the childhood. You know, it, it can be years of, of things going on, causing this 
complex PTSD. Um, this will soon be added to the World Health Organization's um, classification of diseases, um, but currently it's not in the DSM-5. And then of course, there's the indirect exposure. So those, uh, those of you who are clinicians, this could be things that you're hearing from your clients. We have first responders, things that they might see. Um, it could be learning about an event, um, especially if it's a violent event or an ac accidental event. So it's really very broad. The indirect exposure is broad, but it is also very real. <clears throat> so when it comes to substance abuse, um, so substance abuse can lead to traumatic events, which is increasing the development, developing of PTSD. <clears throat> so many people with PTSD, <clears throat> they tend to misuse alcohol specifically. Um, and then many who struggle with alcohol misuse, they also suffer from PTSD. So it's kind of like a, like kind of like a back and forth thing right there. Um, many use drugs or alcohol to try to manage and cope with the PTSD symptoms. Uh, PTSD and problems with alcohol simultaneously can exas exacerbate the symptoms of each disorder. And then those seeking treatment for PTSD, they're 14 times more likely to be diagnosed with a substance use disorder. <clears throat> so there's a very close correlation between substance use um, and PTSD. Um, and so th this is a book that I read a while ago, uh, The Boy Who Was Raised as a Dog. It's written by Dr. Bruce Perry. Um, he is a child psychiatrist. <clears throat> um, really, the biggest takeaway from the book is that <clears throat> the brain is capable of change despite severe trauma, right? So healing is always possible. That's one of the most phenomenal things I think about our brain <clears throat> is that while it can change in a negative way, it can also, you know, through, like I, I look at it like little brain exercises can train into um, a, a positive, healthy brain as well. But understanding that healing can be possible it can provide like just even like the little littlest bit of hope for somebody who might really be struggling. Um, and then healthy and trusting and safe relationships are so crucial when it comes to healing with heal, healing trauma. So a little bit about this book that really got me, I'm very interested in the neurological side of, um, of PTSD and how it works in the body. So um, this book is a series of stories, series of treatments. They're short, um, it's, but it's very, it's very interesting. Um, at, at one point, the author talks about a girl who was um, experiencing triggers from a trauma and she was disassociating. And at, at one point, they had no idea that she even had trauma. This is a teenage girl. Um, at one point, she was on, she passed out, she was unconscious and they thought she was in, she, they thought she was on drugs. So she's taken to the hospital, she's being, you know, they can't find any drugs in her system. They don't understand what's going on. Um, and so the author uh, was called in to kind of assess the situation. And he determined that she was actually disassociating and her body had put her into this overdose mode to really try to mask that pain that she was feeling, but it went too far. And so he actually gave her Narcan and she, she came to consciousness. So I just thought the, that it seemed so powerful that PTSD can actually have such a, a strong effect on somebody's um, brain and their body. And so a little bit about the neurological effects of PTSD. So after a trauma event, the brain is unable to really, what they say, rest and digest the event. So it really keeps this brain heightened and in survival mode. So the inability for the brain to relax, it leaves a lasting impression of trauma on the brain, which leads to the development of PTSD. So one of my favorite words, I love to say this word, amygdala. I just, I don't know why, I think it rolls off the tongue nicely, but the amygdala is that little, if you see on the, um, on the, in the center of the brain, it's that little almond shape area inside the brain. It's really the fire alarm of the brain. It's, the, it's what goes off, it senses the danger, and it's really what sends the signals out to go into trauma response. Um, well, then we have the hippocampus, that is really the learning center of the brain. It's really taking the event in, it's um, really kind of recording what's going on as it relates to the fire alarm from the amygdala. And then we have the prefrontal cortex. So that's the rational decision-making part of the brain. And this is linked to the emotional regulation. Um, and a little bit more about the amygdala because I think it's really important to understand that research shows that the amygdala, it, it does not differentiate between a threat then and a threat now. So 
therefore it's going to respond to as if the event is happening again for the very first time. So as the brain is taking in all this information and it's recording the information and but it's also staying at this heightened state when there's a trigger when when something sets it off it's going to react again as if the event is happening again for that first time. So the brain is sending a rush of uh, the stress hormone cortisol, which is causing one to feel on edge on high alert. Um, in some cases, one may experience a high level of stress at all times and a normal resting heart rate that is elevated long time or for a long term, it can lead to um, bad cardiovascular complications. And so a little bit about the symp sympathetic nervous system. So what you're gonna what we have here is this chain reaction um, where the amygdala sends off the the acute stress response to the um, then it goes to the hypothalamus that learning center it's ap activating the sympathetic nervous system it's sending the signals through the automatic nerves to the adrenal glands the adrenal glands are then re re releasing the hormones right that would be the adrenaline the cortisol is all being sent to the body the body is going on on alert. Um, and blood vessels are constricting to maintain blood pressure during the stress. And then we have the trauma response is now um, the freeze, flight, um, fight, fawn, flop mode. And so in the trauma response, um, you know, what is actually happening? And so this is the physiological effects that trauma can have on somebody. So pupils are dilating, letting more light in around to see the surroundings. Um, the skin, the skin might pale as the blood vessels are signaling and diverting blood into other areas of the body. The heart is, begins to pump harder it deliver, to deliver more oxygen as the blood pressure is increasing. Muscles are receiving more blood and oxygen to provide greater strength and speed to the muscles. Uh, the liver is converting to glucose for more stored energy. And the airways are opening up, so more oxygen is being delivered to blood and muscles. So you can see really the body is, is designed to go into this survival mode. And that is exactly what's happening with this with the trauma response. Uh, and so a little bit about going from the trauma to at the actual post-traumatic stress disorder. So there's some different areas of, of symptoms that people can, um, can experience. Some people might experience more of a fear-based, re-experiencing emotional and behavioral symptoms that may be more prevalent. Um, other people may have the anhedonic or the dysphoric mood states, which would, you know, the negative cognitions that might be more prominent. So maybe loss of interest, maybe depression is, is more prevalent. Um, and in some people, they might experience more arousal and, and reactive externalizing symptoms. So increased stress, irritability, um, some people might show more of the disassociative sy symptoms. And then you have, of course, anybody can experience any kind of combination of these symptoms. Um, but it's also important to know that one of the most dangerous side effects um, or symptoms of PTSD is the association with suicidal thoughts or behavior. Uh, and so I have a, a definition here from the DSM, it's, but basically the presence of PTSD is associated with an increased likelihood of transitioning from suicidal thoughts to a suicidal plan or attempt. So it's just, it's very important to understand that, um, that this is, while it's not listed as a criteria of PTSD, it is a, um, a very dangerous symptom. Um, and so what constitutes this trauma I didn't put much on here because there, I think there's just so much. People perceive things differently. Everyone's experiences are different. So what, what somebody, what might be a very big emotional deal to somebody might not be as much to somebody else. So um, we're just gonna, gonna kind of go over the, the basics of trauma. Maybe the, um, I know there's a lot that falls under the umbrella, but war exposure, this could be um, civilian or combat exposure. Um, any kind of physical violence, it could be realistically perceived, it could be an actual imminent threat. Um, so, you know, any kind of any situation that involves physical violence, uh, sexual trauma. Um, I put in here also like alcohol and drug facilitated non consensual, because I think sometimes we think of, um, you know, the, the obvious sexual trauma that, you know, we hear about all the time, but there's, you know, things that can happen, especially when you are in active addiction. Um, and so I wanna make sure that we are covering these things as well, and including unwanted exposure to, to pornography and maybe some things that are being seen. 
Um, bullying is a new classification. Uh, it is included in the DSM, but um, it, it's listed as threat of serious harm. But again, I would say it's realistically perceived or it could be an actual, you know, something that's actually going on. It could be emotional. And so bullying is really just another category, I think, that, that can constitute as, as a trauma. Um, life-threatening medical emergencies. This could be a, a sudden life-threatening event, um, or this, this could be an invasive treatment that somebody's had to go through, whether it's one time or over years. Um, and so again, there's many different things that can fall under that category. Um, and witnessed events. Witnessed events can be anything from you know, maybe somebody who has been in, in a serious accident and, you know, lost a loved one. This could be, you know, somebody who's who's a first responder. This is be a little bit more of that indirect exposure as well. So witness events really is, um, I think, the most broad category because I think you could witness any of the above traumas. Uh, we'll go a little bit into the symptoms of PTSD. So the symptoms, they can change over time. They can appear within three months and they can also take years to fully emerge. So there's a, I'm gonna go over the categories of the symptoms. So the reactivity symptoms, this would be reckless behavior, hypervigilance, heightened startle response, um, irritability, angry outbursts, maybe trouble thinking, concentrating, maybe trouble learning. Um, when you think about it, the brain is still in this heightened sense of arousal, so it can be difficult to really problem solve and concentrate and learn new things. Um, sleep problems, uh, sleep problems can involve, you know, being unable to sleep um, or not getting, a, you know, not getting good rest, lack of motivation. So, right, I, we talked about the brain being on high alert, so the brain is using so much energy to protect from these perceived threats. Um, and so, and communication challenges. Again, the brain on high alert, it may not accurately pick up on how others think or feel or understand motives. So um, that can be difficult, especially in relationships. The communication can be um, a, a real struggle there. Uh, intrusive symptoms. So this would be things reoccurrent, just like reoccurrent distressing memories, um, nightmares, flashbacks, panic attacks, um, avoidance symptoms. So avoiding di these distressing memories, not wanting to talk about things that had happened or avoidance of the external stimulants, right? Avo avoiding people, places, things. And then we have the negative mood symptoms. So this would be um, unable to remember certain aspects of the event. You know, um, this could be negative self-beliefs, uh, maybe blame, difficulty experiencing positive emotions, feeling detached from others, maybe feeling estranged. Um, a negative emotional state and a reduced interest. So these are the, the main criteria. And then obviously being in this heightened sense of, of arousal with this elevated heart rate, it's gonna lead to health effects, right? So chronic exposure to stress levels, it can lead to hormonal and endocrine abnormalities and that can be related to some diseases. So it can be related to cardiovascular effects chronic diseases and circulatory diseases as well. Uh, let's talk about a little bit about triggers. So with the triggers, the brain is gonna respond as if the person is still in the past. This is triggering fear, anxiety, and stress. So here are some ways to cope with a trigger or a trigger trauma response. So moving your body. So getting those endorphins released, that can help. Using grounding techniques, um, I, I put a, Little thing up here on the side, an example for a visual grounding for PTSD. Um, going outside, getting some fresh air, practicing self-care. So this could be maybe doing something nice for yourself that night, or you know, maybe taking a warm bath or going for a nice walk, doing something that, that feels good, right? Um, sitting in the motions, that actually that can be a really tough one to do. Um, but I think sitting in the motions is, is a way to start to be able to process what it is that is going on. Uh, emotional freedom techniques. This is EFT. Uh, it, it, otherwise, it's called tapping. So tapping is a practice that consists of tapping with your fingers on specific meridian points while talking through the traumatic memories um, and a wide range of emotions. Um, and then getting support. That's a big one, right? Getting support from friends, family, community, whether it's counseling, whether there are support groups. Um, but getting support and talking to others 
is another way to, to be able to figure out ways that you can work through your triggers. And I like the saying, even the largest avalanche is triggered by small things. Um, and I just think about that, how inside, again, we don't know what's going inside of somebody and it can just be a bunch of little things. And then this, this anger can come out or these, you know, emotional um, outbursts can come out. And, you know, it, it is these little things, they, they can add up and they can really trigger bigger things. Uh, just another example on dealing with on how to uh, cope with triggers. Um, calling somebody if you're feeling triggered, it's really great to have a plan so that when these triggers happen, um, there's already, you know, there's not much thought on, on what to do. You already kind of know what to do. So exercising regularly, keeping a journal, um, a journal might help to help you to identify your triggers so you can be prepared for them. Um, anticipate a, a plan for coping with the, with the triggers becoming aware, like we talked about, practicing these re relaxation technique, techniques. So um, co-occurring disorders, with, uh, when it comes to the PTSD and addiction, um, individuals with co-occurring substance use disorders and PTSD, they suffer a more complicated course of treatment and less favorable treatment outcomes compared to individuals with either disorder alone. However, several integrated psychosocial treatments for co-occurring SUD and PTSD have demonstrated promising outcomes. Um, and so really how this works, PTSD, it can actually change brain chemistry similar to the way substances do. So traumas that cause PTSD can also trigger a substance use disorder. So for example, you have the trauma experience um, and then the brain now decreases the endorphins. So alcohol and other mood enhancing substances will increase the endorphin levels. And then now substances have become the coping skill for relief of symptoms. Um, and I feel like some of these slides could actually be their own presentation, but I did wanna to touch a little bit on, on, the, on the trauma informed approach. Um, so trauma informed care, it seeks to realize the widespread impact of trauma so that we can understand these paths for recovery, um, recognizing the signs and symptoms of trauma and integrating knowledge about trauma into um, policies, procedures, and practices, and also actively avoiding to re-traumatize somebody. Um, the core principles of trauma-informed approach would be patient empowerment. So you really wanna look to use someone's strengths to help empower, the, empower them in their own treatment. Choice, it, it, choice is a very uh, big one, of course. Um, the patients should have control over their treatment. So, um, you know, collaborating with the patient regarding their treatment options and giving them the choice that, of options that they prefer. Collaboration, I just kind of mentioned a little bit, you know, collaborating with the client together, um, maybe including families, maybe some other um, staff in, in, in the treatment planning. Safety, uh, you wanna make sure that the person is feeling safe and that they're in an environment that is also emotionally and physically safe and uh, a trustworthiness. So you, you wanna make sure that the relationship, that there is trust there. Uh, and so here are some of the treatment options. Um, I'm gonna, we'll go through just the, the main options. I know that there can be other, other ways to do it. Um, but the first one is cognitive processing therapy. So this is a treatment that is very, is strongly recommended for um, working with PTSD. Uh, CPT teaches how to change upsetting thoughts and feelings related to the trauma. Um, prolonged exposure, it, that is another form of treatment that is strongly recommended. It teaches to gradually approach trauma-related memories, feelings, and situations that have been avoided since the trauma. Uh, the eye movement desensitization and reprocessing or EMDR, this is a conditionally re uh, recommended, meaning I think it, you know, it's not like everyone uh, necessarily needs to <clears throat> take on this form of therapy. It would be something I think that would, you would wanna evaluate and, and, and see if it would be right for the, for, for the client. But EMDR helps process and make sense of trauma while paying attention to a back and forth movement or sound. Um, and so that could be like a finger waving side to side. It could be a light or even a tone. And then written exposure therapy, it helps to find new ways to think about trauma and its meaning through written assignments completed during the sessions. 
So that would be a, a pretty brief therapy, about five sessions. So just a little bit more in depth about um, CPT. So it is a specific type of cognitive behavioral therapy. So it is helping to, to modify and challenge the um, unhelpful beliefs that are related to the trauma. Um, it has been effective in reducing symptoms. It's typically delivered over 12 sessions. Um, CPT uses education um, regarding PTSD as well as thoughts and emotions. It really helps people to learn how to challenge and modify their unhelpful beliefs related to the trauma. And then it creates a new understanding and uh, conceptualization of the trauma event and helps to reduce the negative effects on their current life. Uh, so prolonged ex exposure, so PE, uh, it teaches individuals to gradually approach their trauma-related memories, feelings, and situations, learning that the trauma-related memories and cues are not dangerous and do not need to be avoided. So this is also another type of cognitive behavioral therapy. It teaches individuals to gradually approach their memories, the feelings, and their situations. Um, PE decreases symptoms of PTSD by actively learning that the trauma-related memories are cues and not dangerous. They do not need to be avoided. Uh, this usually typically takes about three months, um, usually weekly sessions that are about an hour to an hour and a half long. Um, imaginal exposure. So that would be in the sessions, working with somebody to describe the event, processing the emotions, um, maybe recording the, the session and listening to it, um, listening back to it. And then the in vivo exposure is an as another aspect. So that would be like a homework. So identifying the stimuli um, in order for the person to really start to begin to confront that. And so with the EMDR therapy, it, this is a structured therapy. It encourages the person to briefly focus on the trauma memory while experiencing the bilateral stimulation, um, which would be the eye, mo eye movements associated with the reduction in the, with the vividness and the emotion associated with the trauma. So unprocessed memories, they can contain the emotions, thoughts, beliefs, and the physical sen sensations that occurred at the time of the event. And then when these memories are triggered, those stored disturbing elements are experienced and it's causing the symptoms of PTSD and other disorders. So EMDR focuses directly on the memory, changing the way the memory is stored in the brain and then reducing and eliminating the problematic symptoms. So typically uh, it's one to two times per week for a total anywhere from six to 12 sessions. So I'm gonna go a little bit into EMDR more so because there, there are some phases I wanted to talk about. Um, the first phase is history taking and treatment planning. So that would be conducting a full history, um, the therapist and client working together to identify targets for treatment. And these targets would include um, past memories, current triggers, future goals. The next step would be preparation. So um, explaining the treatment with the client, introducing procedures, practicing the eye movements, and ensuring that the client has adequate resources um, really just making sure that the client has a safe, calm place exercise uh, that they can enact. Uh, assessment would be uh, the next phase. So activating the memory that is being targeted in the session. So this would be identifying and then ass assessing each of the memory components, which would be the image, cognition, the affect, and the body sensation. So there are two measures um, that are used during EMDR therapy sessions to evaluate the changes. Um, one would be uh, a subjective unit of disturbance scale. So that would be kind of a true false positive uh, cognition. So it'd be asking questions, true or false, asking clients true or false questions um, about their cognition. And then the next scale would be a validity of cognition. So this is like rating on a one to 10, a, a disturbance. And these measures are used again during the treatment process, it's just to kind of evaluate where the, where the client is at. Um, the next phase would be a desensitization stage. So the client's focusing on the memory while engaging in the bilateral stimulation um, and then reporting whatever new thought might emerge. Um, therapists can then de determine the focus of each set of the uh, bilateral stimulation by using those standardized procedures. Um, and then associated material can become the focus of the next set of the brief BLS and then the process continues until the client reports that the memory is no longer distressing. Uh, the installation is the next phase, this can strengthen the preferred positive cog cognate 
that cognition that we want to, that the client wants to see. Um, body scan is next, observing physical responses while thinking about the incident. Um, and the positive cognition, cognition, identifying any residual distress that is still kind of there. Um, if the client reports any d disturbance, um, there are standardized procedures involving the bilateral simulation that are used to process that. Um, and then we come to closure. So we're trying, you know, coming to end the session. So if the targeted memory was not fully processed during the session, specific instructions and techniques are used to provide containment. Um, and then ensuring the client's safety until the next session. And then reevaluation is the last phase. So evaluating the, the current psychological state, whether treatment effects have maintained, um, what memories may have emerged since the last session, and working with the client to identify targets for the current session. Um, and then here's just a brain scan that I thought was interesting. So on the left, we have the brain showing overactivity in red. And then we have the same brain um, after an EMDR treatment. So you can see how much the, the activity has lessened. And then, so there is medication that is available. Um, there are, let's see, so it's, and forgive me, I'm not um, good at pronouncing medical prescription names. So uh, there's sertraline, paroxetine, floxetine, and then lost vaccine. I'm sure I, I'm sure I just murdered those, but um, you can read them, write them down if you're interested. But they're selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, so SSRIs. Um, so the serotonin and the paroxetine are the only medications that are currently approved by the FDA for PS, PTSD. There are other medications for PTSD, such as topiramate. Um, this is one that's also been found helpful in reducing alcohol consumption in those with an alcohol use disorder. Topiramate is an anti-epileptic medicine. There are some side effects that may outweigh the benefits, but with any of these medications or with any medications, um, right, they're not for everybody. People require, you know, might need different things. Everyone's needs are so different. Um, so there are medications out there um, that people can talk to their doctor about. And so friends and family, um, when it comes to PS PTSD, there are ways that friends and family can help. Um, so research suggests that healthy, positive relationships can help lay a foundation for healing. People with higher levels of social support experience less intense symptoms of PTSD. Um, and so symptoms of PTSD can affect a person's family and friends. So everyday things might be more difficult and this may lead to um, unmet family needs increasing stress on their partners and children. And so here are some ways that somebody that you can help somebody um, that you care about as they you know are working through their symptoms of PTSD. So really learning what makes them feel safe. Um, you don't need to help them avoid their fear, but you can allow them to decide when they're ready to engage with something and just support their decisions. Reassuring them of their worth and their lovability. So verbal affirmations really may help them during a trigger. So just something simple, you know, I'm not going anywhere. I love you. These are just some ways that you can give these po positive affirmations to somebody when they're um, struggling. Staying in clear communication. This is another really important thing because the communication symptoms with somebody with PTSD can be really diff difficult to process. So because everyone has different symptoms and triggers that the clear communication can help plan for the most supportive ways to respond when a trigger arises. So it really can be helpful to ask somebody um, questions if you think that they're experiencing um, a trigger. So maybe something, hey, you sound kind of irritated. What are you experiencing right now? How can I help you? Um, and so just really being supportive, but being um, communicative. Um, grounding techniques, and this is something that you can do together. So it's called co-regulation, um, and it really helps to regulate the nervous system. Um, it can help someone to feel more at ease, and you can also help to feel more connected with one another. Um, affirming their strengths, really uh, identifying and appreciating the way that somebody who, who does have PTSD, the way that they've grown and, and talk about their healing journey. Um, you know, just saying things like, I admire your bravery, I appreciate your ability to cope. These are just some, it's, you know, affirming the strengths combined with that positive affirmation as well. Um, and embark on a learning journey. So 
really just doing research, you know, maybe reading additional information um, and, and examining, you know, what some of their triggers are, uh, really can also help to support somebody um, who is struggling with PTSD. So PTSD can cause actions in a person that, that really may, are, may be trauma responses. So a trauma response, because it's uh, the body's way of protecting itself, even if the behavior doesn't seem rational in that moment. So understanding, you know, that this irrational behavior is really more of a trauma response, um, it kind of helps you to understand and maybe might be helpful in how you react and support someone. Um, things not to do if somebody um, is struggling with PTSD, avoiding statements that can minimize their feelings. Um, causing, you know, you don't want to cause them shame or unfair comparisons, right? So obviously you don't want to say something like, what's wrong with you? Or, you know, you're overreacting. Um, those kind of things are, are not, would not be helpful. And then lastly, we want to just really self-care, you know, especially if you're caring for somebody um, who does have PTSD, it, it can be intense at times. And so it's important to have self-care. So taking care of your own mental health. Um, this can be done by joining support groups, you can seek counseling or therapy, you can educate yourself about PTSD, and, and really setting boundaries for yourself is, is very important, because your self-care, you, you can't help somebody if you can't help yourself, so definitely making sure that you have some boundaries up for your own self. Um, I put some resources up here. So the Anxiety and Depression Association of America has some great PTSD information. Um, NAMI is always a great source of mental health support in general. The U.S. Department of Veteran Affairs has just a slew of support and resources. I mean, if you think of any kind of support for anybody, they have just a ton of links on there. And then Psych Central is also a great wealth of um, information, whether it's informational on PTSD, um, as well as a ton of resources that you can click on to get more information. And so these are just some references and that's really kind of the end of it. I'd, I'd love to open up for some questions, but even more so I'd love for there to, you know, if there's a discussion, like I said, I came from a place of curiosity, not a place of expertise. So I'm curious to hear what some of your thoughts, um, your thoughts would be. So thank you. Thanks, Sam. I'll, uh, I'll open it up for questions or comments or anything. I just, uh, well, thank you for the presentation, A, but um, I just wanted to, uh, pass another kind of little anecdotal thing on. I have a friend who has been struggling with PTSD pretty severely um, for a number of years due to some traumatic events. Um, and he tried a lot of different stuff, right? He tried medication, he tried uh, therapeutics. Um, and he recently, um, for, the first tr for the first time, tried some of those other treatments like the um, EMDR and some other things. And he has found a lot of success. Um, and I've heard that from, from a number of people. Um, and, you know, Danny and I and Sam and other people in our office are always looking at different kinds of treatments and how to access them because we're looking at it as a, you know, multiple pathways to recovery from this stuff. What, what works for somebody won't work for somebody else. And my, my thought is I'm glad there's all this stuff, right? I'm glad there's new kind of cutting edge stuff. Um, I just sometimes worry about people being able to access it you know, people who need it the most being able to access it. And that was, that was some of our concern when we looked into some of it, you know, um, at Serenity House, we, we take uh, a lot of people who are unhoused, we take people who are coming out of uh, institutions who really are trying to rebuild uh, their lives and sometimes don't even have an ID, let alone access to something like that. Um, and so I think it's, uh, it's important for us um, as practitioners, but just people, just people who have lived experience, to always try to advocate for accessibility for these things. Um, and some of the people who need them the most should have access to them without worrying about uh, barriers of insurance or barriers of, of being able to pay for things. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm glad I learned a ton about all this stuff. Um, it was really, really informative. So I'm gonna open it up for anybody else who wants to comment or has any questions or anything. I just wanna say great job, Sam. <clears throat> As somebody who, suffers from complex PTSD, you know, it was good to see a lot of the information that you put out there, um, you know, and specifically talking about anything could be a trauma. I had a couple of major traumas that were easily recognized, but there's so many other little things that happened in my life that it, not until I went to get help for my PTSD that I really understood where some of the things, some of the triggers for my addiction came from. 
So I'm really glad that you pointed that out. And again, great presentation. Thank you. Hi, can you hear me? Hi, Felicia. Yep. We had you, you were unmuted. And I think now you're frozen. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, this, this was a big undertaking. There was so many directions. I went down so many rabbit holes that I had to pull myself out of because I just wanted to share so, so much. But um, yeah, it, especially when it comes to the, the physiological effects, I, I just find it so interesting that it can have such a se severe intensity with control over your body and that there's nothing you can do about that when, it, when it's you know, being activated. Yeah. Yeah, I wanted to say I really appreciate um, you sharing uh, on the complex PTSD. Um, the field that I work in is the anti-human trafficking field, and I'm a survivor as well. So I have complex complex PTSD, and a lot of times they will relate um, a war veteran to what a woman goes through um, in that life. Our our PTSD coincides with the PTSD as a war, a war veteran. Um, and I don't know if that just, it, it just equates to like the many men that we have to deal with in a one day period. It's just like, we are at war, That's you good. know? Yeah, so, oh, Felicia, you're back. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, um, I was just saying like doing like friends and family support group meetings um, frequently. We didn't know that living with someone that, you know, at the height of their addiction, you get phone calls in the middle of the night. There's always an emergency state. You don't know where your child is or your loved one's at. Um, we didn't think that we were struggling with PTSD because we thought of it as something, like you said, like um, something one traumatic event. But after um, learning more about it, we certainly meet the criteria for living with PTSD. And Sam, a lot of those treatments that, that you said have helped a lot of people in my friends and family um, group, especially EMDR. So just knowing that there's treatment out there and even knowing that you have PTSD, um, like Jared said, he didn't think he qualified. Um, but certainly living with someone that's struggling um, does qualify as PTSD. And I just thought that was interesting. Yeah, thank you, Felicia. That's an, that's an, uh, there's another aspect that is just, um, it's not what people generally think of, right? What the, the mental um, anguish that someone goes through, you know, supporting a loved one in an active addiction, right? Like, you know, right, right there. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Felicia and Becky. Thanks for sharing. I'm um, glad you can come on and, and talk a little bit about your own experience too. Um, did anybody else have any questions or comments? If I may, please. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. Hey, ben. Um, in my former lives as a counselor and a recovery coach, you know, um, uh, I remember many years ago, like about 10 or 15 years ago, trauma studies was a kind of a virtually not, I don't know, it wasn't that it was unknown, but it wasn't, it's just remarkable how uh, trauma studies have evolved and moved and changed and grown um, you know, over the years. Uh, it's just remarkable to me um, that, you know, when I had a, 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 a caseload and was trying to figure out how I was going to help people and, and, and what to do. Um, I came upon a book uh, by a woman named Judith Herman called uh, Trauma and Recovery. This was written in the 90s, um, and it just blew my mind, you know, how prevalent it was. And uh, as I started working with trauma and trauma-informed care with clients, I realized uh, I had uh, that pretty much 100% of my clients suffered from some sort of trauma. And... Um, just a thing that I wanted to share that uh, um, a lot of us uh, 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 or a couple of us got in contact with as far as dealing with or working with trauma. Um, and there's so many things. Um, but one of the things that 
was effective for some people was doing physical things, uh, getting out in the world, nature walks. Um, I had a lot of guys that I worked with that were traumatized, you know, just getting a basketball and going to the park and see if you could make a basket, uh, walking around, doing something physical with your body. Uh, anyway, I'm grateful to you, Samantha, for this uh, research. And uh, I'm like you, I was curious. I'm not an expert, um, but it's just something else, man, really uh, uh, eye-opening and uh, uh, interesting and uh, ultimately healing processes that uh, uh, it ain't over, you know, just because you suffer from PTSD, you know, there's stuff to do. You can integrate these experiences in your life and therefore create a kind of a wisdom about you um, that other people don't have. Uh, so uh, still fascinated by trauma and how it, it, it inflects and, and, and reverberates through our lives and through our culture. But that's all. Thank you, Samantha. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Yeah. Um, hey, um, this is Lisa Blue. I'm with Northwestern Medicine Behavioral Health. I just wanted to say that um, really it's trauma is such a huge field right now. And that expression you use going down a rabbit hole and really picking and choosing what you know can really help shift mindsets and, and what it is. I think you did an amazing job. Um, I'm wondering how much work it took to do that. And your slides were really, really magnificent. Um, one thing I want to add is um, there's a, a great book out, Jan Win Winhall. She really talks, she uses polyvagal theory to really um, act as the foundation of his trauma. There's so much dialogue about trauma being an event or a series of events and then event turned into experiences, but really it's the nervous system's response and that makes it incredibly um, arbitrary and it's not about severe trauma or um, you know war it's really about the individual nervous system telling telling oneself and the world this is traumatic for me it's traumatic stress um, there's a great expression um, that came from that book and also from um, Jamie Merrick some of you might be familiar with her work and she's heavily um, involved in, in training and her own recovery work was using EMDR, but she talks about um, addiction as a active dissociation or using substances as an active dissociation, which is really pointing to the important notion that using substances is really an attempt to regulate one's body and nervous system. So, um, mm -hmm. Um, if anyone wants more information about that book, I think it's really valuable in terms of working in our field um, with substance use, misuse, and addiction and um, trauma recovery. So thank you, Samantha. This was really wonderful. Thank you, Lisa. Could you put the name of that book in the chat? Sure. Thank you. Thank you for that. Awesome. Thank you, Lisa. Um, we, we got about a minute left. I do just want to announce just a couple of future meetings that are happening, especially this one for next month. Um, so I mentioned earlier, the DuPage Ross Council meetings themselves are on the second Wednesday of every month. Um, and next month in June, as it's Pride Month, we're going to feature some organizations that are working in that area. So um, we did this last year, too, talking about the need for specialized services for LGBTQIA+. Um, we'll be kind of looking at some other organizations doing the same thing uh, this year. So that's on June 14th uh, at 3 p.m. Um, on June 21st, I actually just confirmed this. So for the next uh, Ross presentation series, 10 a.m. on the 21st, we're going to be doing um, harm reduction stuff. So Steve Stefani, who runs uh, Hope for Healing, uh, which also does work with Live for Lolly, which is the big harm reduction organization up here, will be coming on. And we're just going to talk about harm reduction 101. What's the work that's being done? Uh, what are the trends that we're working with in that space? Uh, and hopefully try to maybe open some minds or open some minds even further as far as the, the, the need for that type of work. Uh, so we hope we can see you at that one. Um, again, thank you everybody for coming, Sam. Great presentation. Um, if anybody uh, wants to share this or uh, you know somebody who missed it, it should be up on the YouTube page by the end of the week. I'll send a follow-up email with a link to everybody. Uh, but other than that, thank you for coming and we'll uh, see you the next month.